on World News Tonight. Major crash. The search for survivors continues following China's Eastern Airlines passenger jet falling mid-flight and crashing back down. Hopes are waning on any live victims being found. Discussion time. Ukrainian President Zelensky insists on face-to-face -face talks with President Putin, claiming it may be the only way the two nations find common ground in the conflict and make way for diplomacy. Resisting Russia. As global tensions rise, Ukrainian forces on the front lines refuse to give up and continues to defend their land from Russian forces, claiming the country will never surrender. And blooming spring. Cherry blossoms decorate nature in celebration of the coming of spring, leaving Mother Nature to display her best works of art. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with a search for answers as the Boeing 737 suddenly fell into a dive. The major jet crash in China has set off alarm bells as rescue teams search for any survivors following the impact. Unfortunately, it's expected that none survived the crash. Rescuers in China were scouring the remnants of a disastrous plane crash in southern Guangxi province, searching for victims with no sign of any survivors on Tuesday. There were 132 people on board when the aircraft went down the day before, a China Eastern Airlines flight from Kunming to Guangzhou that suddenly plunged and crashed into heavily forested mountains. It's China's first commercial jet crash since 2010, and investigators are now searching for the Boeing 737-800 jet's flight recorders to figure out what went wrong. Relatives and colleagues of the flight passengers gathered at Guangzhou's Baiyun International Airport Monday, waiting for any news. One man said he came to the airport to confirm whether his co-worker was one of the victims, and later informed the victim's family. State media reported that China Eastern and two of its subsidiaries have grounded their fleet of 737-800 planes, while other Chinese airlines have yet to do so, according to Chinese aviation data provider Flightmaster. Analyst Robert Spingarn says the jet shouldn't be confused with the 737 MAX, which has been grounded in China for over three years following fatal crashes in 2018 and 2019. The aircraft itself that crashed uh, earlier today was delivered new in 2015, so it's about six years old, but the model has over 20 years of experience and has a relatively positive, strong track record. So this is not a MAX. And frankly, the system that was at the core of the MAX situation uh, is not on this aircraft. Monday's flight took a disastrous turn just when it would normally start its descent ahead of landing. A former head of the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration told mechanical failures in modern commercial jets are rare at cruising altitude. Now in the latest tensions between Ukraine and Russia, Ukrainian President Zelensky has insisted that middle ground between the two conflicting countries could not be found unless the two leaders met face to face to discuss the stakes of the situation. Stretches of Ukraine's Mariupol are now piles of rubble. Satellite images show thick smoke billowing from blackened apartment buildings after the heaviest bombing since Russia launched its invasion. Late on Monday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky insisted on meeting Russian leader Vladimir Putin and said it was not possible to negotiate an end to war without meeting him. I have repeated and offered this for a few years. I think that without this meeting, you cannot fully understand what they are prepared to do in order to stop the war and what they're prepared to do if we are not ready for this or that compromise. Zelensky has tried to meet with Putin for a year, but he has refused. Russia calls the war a special military operation to disarm Ukraine and protect it from what it calls Nazis. Putin says NATO, as an instrument of the United States, was building up its military on Ukraine's territory in a way that threatened Russia. On Monday, Zelensky also repeated that Ukraine would not now join NATO. Meanwhile, no power, no food, no heating in Mariupol, with people struggling to survive in basements. International Red Cross President Francesco Rocca said an aid convoy can't enter the city. It's stuck, stuck, no access. 
So they are they are they 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 they, they, they can go. So from uh, the Ukrainian Red Cross side, they are still waiting the green light. When we talk about uh, humanitarian access, it's not about uh, only about evacuation, uh, but it's also about uh, logistics. It's also about to bring uh, relief, food. As you know, hundreds of thousands are stuck without uh, electricity, water, and unfortunately the possibility to provide them uh, the support that they need. Elsewhere in the city, grim scenes of the war's impact, with people digging graves in the middle of the street for their own neighbours. The UN Agency for Human Rights says it has been unable to receive or verify the death toll and casualty numbers from badly hit cities like Mariupol. But officials in Mariupol say around 2,500 people have died since Russia's invasion. Russia denies targeting civilians. As the violence continues to escalate, global leaders fear that Ukraine may not be the end goal for Russia. NATO is taking extra precautionary measures to ensure that no new Iron Curtain will prevail within the region due to the invasion. Hours after Russia's attack on Ukraine began, five German warships set sail for Latvia to help protect the most vulnerable part of NATO's eastern flank. Russian aggression has... Russia's invasion has propelled the alliance into what Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg has called a new normal. It looks a lot like the past. NATO was founded in 1949 to defend against the Soviet threat. Now a new Iron Curtain could fall across Europe. NATO needs to ensure its members are not behind it if it does. NATO has expanded eastward since the 1990s, bringing in former Soviet states such as Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia, where these French troops disembarked last week. A single overland corridor connects them to the rest of NATO territory, and it's squeezed between the heavily armed Russian enclave of Kaliningrad and Moscow ally Belarus. An emboldened Russia could encircle the Baltic states and cut them off from the rest of the alliance. That's where the Latvian mission comes in, a regular mine-clearing exercise that was brought forward by Russia's invasion. One goal is to keep the waterway open, the other is a show of strength. This was German naval commander Terje Schmidt Eliasson on board the Elbe in Riga's harbour. We'll be 12 units from six countries and we are essentially showing our presence in the eastern Baltic. Direct confrontation between NATO and Russia could touch off a global conflict. One retired NATO commander told the alliance is considering whether deterrence is enough. Not according to Lithuanian Foreign Minister Gabrielius Landsbergis last week. We are convinced in, in the Baltic states that we need to move from uh, deterrence to a standing defense and has to come from uh, NATO planning uh, uh, leadership, uh, that they would start looking into the region differently than they had throughout the last, uh, last two decades. Since the invasion, NATO allies have also moved five aircraft carriers into European waters, increased the number of warplanes in NATO airspace, and more than doubled the size of combat units in the Baltics and Poland. NATO also faces a return to mechanised warfare and a huge increase in defence spending. And amid ongoing shelling, Russia demanded Ukraine to give up the besieged city of Mariupol. However, despite the attacks it has suffered for the past three weeks, surrender is not an option being considered by Kiev. Ukraine's southern port city of Mariupol has been the victim of brutal bombardments for the past few weeks. And on Monday, Moscow demanded Ukrainians put down their arms and raise white flags in exchange for safe passage out of the city. But maintaining its defiance, Ukraine's answer was no. President Volodymyr Zelensky reaffirmed the country's stance on the same day. Zelensky told local media outlets that his country would never bow to Russia's ultimatums and cities including Kyiv, Mariupol and Kharkiv would not fall into the hands of Moscow. Despite Ukraine's resistance, civilian atrocities are escalating every day. It has been officially established then in 25 days of the full-scale aggression. Kremlin has already killed 150 Ukrainian children destroyed more than 400 schools and kindergartens, 
and more than 110 hospitals. Thousands and thousands of, of civilians were killed. Calling Moscow's brutality state terrorism, the defense minister warned international society that if the Kremlin is not stopped, what Ukraine faces today may become what they encounter tomorrow. Meanwhile, regarding the kidnapping of the mayor of Ukraine's Melitopol, Russia's human rights ombudswoman claimed on Monday local time that he was freed after being exchanged for nine captured Russian soldiers. She said this was the first hostage exchange between the two countries, adding that more than 500 Ukrainian soldiers have been captured by Russia. The mayor was reportedly kidnapped on March 11th by Russian forces, but President Zelensky's office said five days later that he was released without providing further details. Shelling and kidnapping are not the only parts of Russia's playbook, which also includes online attacks. In a statement released on Monday local time, U.S. President Joe Biden pressed businesses to tightly lock their digital doors against possible cyber attacks. This comes after the West instigated multiple economic sanctions to target Moscow's economy and deter it from further attacks. President Biden confirmed his administration would use every tool it had to deter, disrupt and even respond to attacks against critical infrastructure. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. We have some good news for you. A new advancement in the field of vaccines has now given hope to the rest of the world in seeing the light at the end of the tunnel in regards to the COVID crisis. As AstraZeneca has announced, its antibody cocktail is highly effective in neutralizing the new Omicron COVID variant. Drug maker AstraZeneca said on Monday that its COVID drug was effective against new versions of the Omicron variant, including the highly contagious BA2. That's according to an independent study. AstraZeneca said back in December that another lab study found that Evusheld retained neutralising activity against the BA1 version of Omicron, which was the first to spread internationally late last year. The company said in a statement that data from the latest study showed the therapy reduced the viral load of all so-called sublineages of Omicron in mice lungs. The study has yet to be peer-reviewed. Britain's drug regulator said last week that Evusheld was found to cut the risk of developing symptomatic COVID-19 by 77% in trials. It made the announcement after approving the therapy for preventing infections in adults with poor immune response. It's also been shown to save lives and prevent disease progression when given within a week of first symptoms. The therapy is currently under a European review and has already been authorised in the United States. Over in France, the COVID pandemic still continues to have an unrelenting spread. Caseloads have reached a new high, mostly caused by the recent drop in restrictions allowed by the government. And despite the rise, it seems the country will still enjoy the lesser restrictions. Let's cross over to other than the world news special correspondent Chetana Dharmaratne from Normandy in France for more. Chetana. Yes, Anuradi. France has reported an average of close to 90,000 new coronavirus infections over the last seven days, marking a 36% rise from one week ago when most COVID-19 health protocol measures were lifted by the government just ahead of the country's election. The government of French President Emmanuel Macron, who will stand for re-election in less than three e weeks, time followed by a legislative election later this March 14, citing a positive trend. This means people in France no longer have to wear COVID face masks indoors, except for public transport, hospitals and other med medical facilities. The government also lifted its COVID vaccine pass requirements in places such as bars and cinemas. New hospital admissions, seen as a key indicator by France's health minister Olivier Verin, decreased by only 1.7% week on week the slowest decline since early February, potentially indicating a reversal of the previous trends. The recent rise in new infections was particularly strong in France's eastern Alsace region, only one of the zones that suffered most during the start of the pandemic, where authorities re 
uh, recorded well over 1,000 new cases per 100,000 inhabitants. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you. That was other than the new special correspondent, Chetan Radharmaratna from Normandy in France. Some more countries have believed that they will weather the COVID storm. Hong Kong has announced that it too will be easing restrictions as early as April. This may mostly be due to an increasing amount of backlash from residents. Hong Kong said Monday it plans to ease some COVID-19 restrictions next month, a rollback on some of the world's most stringent measures to stop the virus. A ban on flights from nine countries, including Britain, the US and the Philippines, will be lifted. And quarantine for arrivals from abroad will also be reduced for those who test negative. The move announced by leader Carrie Lam follows a backlash from businesses and residents who have become increasingly frustrated by the stringent measures. In the fifth wave of the COVID-19 outbreak, a flight ban was imposed on nine countries. This is no longer necessary because in these countries, the COVID-19 situation is no worse than in Hong Kong, and many travellers coming to Hong Kong do not have any symptoms. Schools will resume face-to-face -face classes after Easter, and public venues, including sports facilities, are also set to reopen next month. On top of this, the city has put on hold plans to carry out mass coronavirus testing. Until this year, Hong Kong had been far more successful at controlling the coronavirus than many other cities its size. However, the latest wave of infections has swamped its medical system. Morgues are overflowing and public confidence in the city government is at an all-time low. As deaths have skyrocketed, experts have urged the city to focus on mitigation strategies as opposed to eradicating the virus. United States President Joe Biden's nominee to the country's highest court, Ketanji Brown-Jackson, has defended her nearly decade-long record as a federal judge as one of independence and fairness. Ketanji Jackson pledged to decide cases without fear or favor if the Senate confirms her historic nomination as the first black woman on the high court. I hope that you will see how much I love our country and the Constitution, and the rights that make us free. The historic Senate confirmation hearing for Supreme Court nominee Ketanji Brown Jackson began Monday with Jackson, who would become the first black woman ever to serve on the high court, pledging to defend American democracy with impartiality. I decide cases from a neutral posture. I evaluate the, the facts and I interpret and apply the law to the facts of the case before me without fear or favor, consistent with my judicial oath. Jackson was nominated in February by President Joe Biden, who as a candidate in 2020 pledged to appoint a black woman to the court. Democrats hailed her selection as a major inflection point for the country. The appointment of a black woman to the court means that your service will make the court look more like America. Hopefully, too, it will make the court think more like America. We won't try to turn this into a spectacle. Republicans promised civility, but some went on the attack, most notably Marsha Blackburn, who pushed hardest on the belief by some Republicans that Jackson, a former public defender, is soft on crime. I can only wonder what's your hidden agenda? Is it to let violent criminals, cop killers, and child predators back to the streets? Democrats jumped to her defense. Judge Jackson is not anti-law enforcement. She hails from a law enforcement family. And no, she's not soft on crime. Jackson, who would replace retiring liberal justice Stephen Breyer, faces questions from senators on Tuesday and Wednesday in what is likely to be a battle in the closely divided Senate. A simple majority vote is needed for her confirmation. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Ghana Central Bank announced its biggest ever interest rate hike as it seeks to slow rampant inflation. China's financial hub Shanghai reported a record surge in COVID infections as authorities scrambled to test residents and rein in the Omicron variant, while closing its Disney resort until further notice. 
Ryanair aims to achieve a third of its decarbonisation targets by flying its planes with sustainable aviation fuels. It will also rely on offsetting measures to cut its emissions to net zero by 2050. People arriving in South Korea who are vaccinated no longer have to self-isolate for seven days. A negative PCR test is still required, but is expected to lead to a large number of people booking vacations and business travel. A Russian court has found jail Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny guilty of large-scale fraud, the court said. Russian prosecutors are seeking to move Navalny to a maximum security penal colony for 13 years on charges of fraud and contempt of court. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you've missed any of the stories we had tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other than English. We're leaving you tonight with a look into the pale and pink and white blossoms that frame the pathways surrounding Washington's iconic monuments. Thank you for watching. Good night.